This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What should colleges do about pro-Palestinian encampments? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Reason Senior Producer, joined by my co-host, Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Reason Roundup newsletter that you should be getting to your inbox every morning. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. College students across America are camping out to demand their universities divest all investments with Israeli-linked companies that they say profit from the occupation and oppression of Palestine. It's gone on for weeks, and even administrators at schools known as bastions of progressive activism are finally getting fed up. Harvard's president is threatening involuntary leave for protesters. Columbia announced on Monday that it canceled its main commencement ceremony for safety reasons. So is USC. UCLA called in the cops to clear its encampment, and police have arrested more than 2,100 protesters across all U.S. campuses since April, according to the Associated Press. Congress has continued to interrogate Ivy League presidents and a bill to explicitly define anti-Semitism for civil rights law enforcement purposes just passed the House with overwhelming support last week. Joining us today to talk about the protests, the backlash, and what it all means for free speech on campus and the wider world is Nico Perino, Executive Vice President of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, and host of the free speech podcast, So to Speak. Nico, thanks for coming on the show. Zach, Liz, I'm happy to be here, and I guess my role is to just answer questions. So ready to do it. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, and you, you know, you're, I know that you are a student of the history of free speech, and even produced a documentary about the great civil liberties icon Ira Glasser. Where do these campus protests sit along the historical continuum of student activism? Are they mostly following a familiar pattern, or is there something fundamentally new and different going on here? They sit along a continuum. I mean, none of this is really new to me. I mean, that's one of the things you mm -hmm. find when you investigate the history of free speech going back millennia is that a lot of the concerns surrounding free speech recur from decade to decade. And we had campus protests, probably most famously in the 1960s. Buildings were occupied. You had Black Panthers taking over buildings with weapons, for example. I, I saw a stat recently that showed that between 1971 and 1972, there were something like 2,500 bombings over an 18 month period. And a lot of it from the weather underground, uh, frankly, but you know, th this sort of kind of political tumult, uh, the controversies, the line drawing between free speech, civil disobedience and violence has been with us throughout American history. Hamilton Hall, which was taken over by the student protesters, for example, has been occupied three prior times, including in 1968. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. And we at FIRE have long seen that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been a source of some of the deepest tensions that we see on college campuses. How are these protests today more, it sounds like they're more mild in a sense than the, t the likes of, you know, the Weather Underground and the Black Panthers. Um, what differences in tactics do you see? <laughs> They do seem more mild, but that's the problem when analyzing any of these campuses is that often the protests are different at each campus. Mm -hmm. And even on specific campuses, they're different. You have different protests hap happening. So you have a fog of war situation com com uh, coming around. And we as civil liberties advocates are having to analyze the facts very intensely to make sure that we don't get something wrong. So at schools like UCLA, for example, where you have an encampment, the protesters and counter protesters ended up fighting with each other in the middle of the night uh, a week or two ago. And you had something like only six police officers there to kind of keep the peace. And this is one of the reasons, of course, colleges and universities prohibit encampments on their campuses because they can't provide 24 hour security for them. Um, we see what happens, for example, when you don't have enough police keeping protesters and counter protesters away from each other. Things like Charlottesville happen where you have dozens of people injured and one person killed. Um, but then again, you also need to allow for protesters and counter protesters to engage with each other to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But you also at the same time, you don't want to um, create a desert and call it peace, so to speak. <laughs> um, 
other campuses you have like UT Austin, for example, a pro-Palestinian group wanted to host a walkout for Palestine and they urged people to kind of bring blankets and come sit on the lawn. What happened? You had armed police on horseback come in and break it up before they were even able to set up a tent. There was no indication that they were going to set up a tent. Maybe there was some inklings, but nothing had happened yet. So this, you get like this minority report effect, right? Where they're like pre-policing mm -hmm. activity. Um, well, and you then also you saw the governor of Texas. I think it's worth noting right at the top of our show, you saw Greg Abbott very explicitly communicating on Twitter that um, his decision to crack down and to expect a more muscular response from Texas state troopers uh, was in part because he wasn't being content neutral. He mentioned the you know explicit um, stated objectives of the protesters uh, as he sort of justified the law enforcement crackdown, which, you know, at least I'm not, uh, I don't work at fire and I'm not a lawyer, but to me that sure looks like he's getting himself into some mighty sticky territory that would probably be prudent to avoid. Well, Liz, it sounds like you could look at fire, work at fire because that's exactly <laughs> the conversation we had here at Fire. Is that Greg Abbott made our job very easy in analyzing the situation on those campuses by <laughs> announcing that his campuses should engage in viewpoint discrimination within that state? Yeah, he talks about hate speech and anti-Semitic speech, and we can get into the, where the lines are there. But generally, when you're talking about public college and university campuses like the UT system, that speech is protected. Hmm. Well, could you tell, could you get a little bit into where those lines are? Because the Abbott case is very clear, but then there's other state, there's other scenarios where maybe a certain viewpoint will be targeted, but not explicitly stated. And really there's just kind of selective enforcement going on here. I mean, anecdotally, I've just heard that a little bit from some academics here in Florida, mm -hmm. where as soon as uh, there there haven't been any big encampments allowed to grow, but no big encampments yet, but you might start one soon, Zach. Who knows? <laughs> but as soon as it uh, starts to, uh, you, you know, if, Pal if a, a Palestinian group, a pro-Palestinian group stays, you know, a minute past curfew, on the public lawn, then um, they're arrested or something like that. So, where, how, how do you legally determine? You know, th this is selective enforcement. Yeah, well, let's let's dive into a Florida a little bit. Florida has a checkered past with free speech. Of course, DeSantis and the legislature passed the Stop Woke Act, which Florida's lawyers are in court right now, arguing that bringing a pro affirmative action speaker to campus or uh, supporting affirmative action if you're a faculty member would violate the Stop Woke Act, which prohibits uh, making arguments, uh, certain arguments around race, sex, gender identity, mm -hmm. for example. So, I mean, to the extent you see college campuses as being free speech bastions, the idea that Justice Sotomayor couldn't come to campus and read her dissent in the fair admissions case, I think says a lot about what they're trying to accomplish there. Florida has also enshrined in law the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which within that definition li lists some examples of core political speech, like comparing the actions of Israel to that of the Nazis mm -hmm. or holding Israel to a standard you don't hold other countries. Uh, countries Like you can say that all of that is you know, like bogus argument, but it's protected speech. People are allowed to be hypocrites. They're allowed to criticize countries, including the United States of America. So, and then you also have Florida that's banning or attempted to ban the Student for Justice in Palestine campus uh, chapters on their campuses. And some of the mm -hmm. actual, the, like the chancellors and presidents of these colleges and universities said, no, we're not going to do that because it's a violation of the First Amendment and it would also open us up to, to um, personal liability if we were to do so. So why is it so hard for Florida to simply wait until these, you know, SJP ch chapters do something incredibly foolish and illegal like why do they have to preemptively begin to crack down on speech as opposed to merely cracking down once an actual thing has been done wrong well you should be a politician liz because i think <laughs> what, the, what you're seeing you a lot of me because i only i only wish that upon my worst enemies Nico. no you sound you sound principled right and what you have is politicians posturing uh, hmm. which is often the antithesis of standing on principles so i i think it plays well to the base quite frankly um, to just say we're going to ban the student group, it makes it seem like you're doing something when really all you're doing is violating the First Amendment. How did the universities <clears throat> find themselves in this situation where these encampments were allowed to grow to the point that they have? I mean, we talked a little bit at the top there about the history of protest on campus. Um, 
how, how were, were occupations and so forth dealt with back then as compared to now? Um, is that making any difference? Well, I think Liz, you had mentioned viewpoint discrimination. I mean, they're inconsistent. Colleges and universities can enforce content neutral time, place, and manner restrictions, things like prohibitions on blocking ingress and egress from faculty building or for academic from academic buildings, uh, things like building occupations, amplified sounds, things that substantially disrupt the operations of the college and university. And, and to that end, they could also ban encampments, but you have colleges and universities that um, approach the encampments differently and have historically. So for example, I went to Indiana University and I believe during the first war, uh, the for first Iraq war, you had encampment for 45 days in Dunmeadow. And then a couple of weeks ago, you have the administration there banning uh, encampments altogether, passing a, a new policy in the middle of the night to ban overnight encampments. And so you you have to ask yourself, is this, is this viewpoint discrimination, right? Um, mm. I have a sense that some the reason they're going on longer at some campuses than maybe you would expect is perhaps some sympathy for the student activists. But my colleague, Keith Whittington, who was at Princeton and now is at Yale, wrote in the Chronicle of Higher Education, like, what are the college administrators going to do when it's Steve Bannon telling folks to encamp on their campuses and not Susan Sarandon, right? Like, yeah. how, you, you need to be have these policies enforced enforced neutrally, and college and university administrators haven't done that consistently in the past. And so, I mean, I guess you can hope for it being better moving forward, but we'll see. So many universities obviously have policies that prohibit encampments. Um, in your view, as somebody who is probably opposed to these sort of like narrowly carved out free speech zones and rather would like to see lots of America, lots of college campuses be a free speech zone. What do you think of the line that universities are drawing surrounding encampments? Should we permit encamp like civil disobedience encampments? Or, well, yeah. I mean, Apart from what universities are sort of, you know, obviously they're legally permitted to, you know. Is it uh, is it know. civil disobedience if you permit it? Uh, well, yeah, maybe not civil. Yeah. But do you think encampment like protest encampments ought to be allowed? Well, we don't tell colleges and universities what they should or shouldn't do with encampments necessarily. Like if they want to allow 24 hour encampments like we're more power to you. We're not going to oppose that. Um, yeah. But. Is it a good thing for a speech for fostering a speech environment? I think is what I'm saying. Well, it depends. Each campus is different, right? Like you have Columbia University where you don't have a ton of open areas on campus. So when they set up their encampment in the same place where you want to host the commencement ceremony a week later, and they're not, they're saying they're not going to leave unless by force, which is something they told the the president of the university and reporters. Um, and and you're having to move your can your classes to virtual, for example, and there you know there's threats of occupying buildings. Like you can see why college and university administrators might want to prohibit encampments in those certain spaces. But like Indiana University, for example, is a big campus, lots of open areas. It's not like a campus in downtown New York City. Um, and so you know, allowing encampments that aren't disruptive, you know, I think would foster a robust free speech and climate. But again, every campus is different. You have yeah. to look at the facts and you look at, have to look at how disruptive they're becoming. Well, let's look at some of the specific campuses and, and facts. I've put together a montage of clips um, for this. This is uh, there's the first clip is from UCLA and then one from University of Washington and then one at UC Berkeley. And essentially it seems to be a pattern of students who are displaying uh, Israeli insignia or carrying Israeli flags being blocked from passing through the campus by protesters. Like they're specifically targeted because of what they are wearing or holding. John, could you roll that clip and then we can discuss? You guys have closed the entrance. We are UCLA students. I have my ID right here. I'm being blocked off, not by the security guard, but by you two. You three. Oh, look, they're making their burger while I'm going this way. Excuse me. This is what they do. Everybody, look at this. Look at this. I'm a UCLA student. I deserve to go here. We pay tuition. This is our school. And they're not letting me walk in. Good afternoon. This is being audio and video recorded. We're going to walk this way. I'm just, I'm just trying to walk around my own campus. I pay tuition here. Just like this, cool, guys. Why are we blocking this? This is I, being I audio and like, video recorded. You guys are all students. Why not? Sorry, I'm just going to... We're going to walk this way. This is, gonna gonna this, way. this is public. This is public space. You're getting very close to me. Can you please step out? Hey! 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 
Oh, so there at the end of that clip there, you can see a police officer starting to intervene. But um, clearly there's this is going beyond speech into something else. Um, it, maybe it seems obvious, but could you just draw some clear lines as to where free expression turns into something beyond free speech? It, it does seem pretty straightforward and obvious to me, um, depending on the state law at play. I mean, it could be assault, it could be false imprisonment, but when it comes down to it, no student should be denied access to their campus uh, based on their identity or their beliefs. It brings into question whether uh, if colleges and universities allow this sort of thing to happen, whether it'd be a Title VI violation of the 1965 Civil Rights Act. Uh, mob blockades against targeted students are unliberal and or illiberal and are unlawful and I mean frankly just can't be tolerated. We saw a little bit of this in 2015 at the University of Missouri. You might remember famously that uh, journalism professor Miss Melissa Click prevented a journalism student from coming in and, and covering campus protests happening on that campus in that year and she called in for some additional muscle to help muscle the protesters out. Like you just don't have the right to take over campus and exclude people based on our identity and beliefs and in some cases they're like it's like the red guard inquisiting them about mm -hmm. what they believe um and frankly again it's just a liberal so yeah, what is the, the appropriate way that universities ought to deal with the students who are doing that well that's the challenge right and that's why you don't envy the job of college or university administrators uh, if, you know as a civil libertarian i want police to be the last resort um, but sometimes it's kind of the only resort when that sort of activity happens you you know you don't you don't want essentially a lawless area of campus to to you know be implemented do you have a perspective as to whether universities ought to be favoring handing sort of jurisdiction over to law enforcement to the cops um you know so in some cases throwing protesters who are violent uh in jail for the night versus trying to exhaust their arsenal of university sanctions available to them as in you know suspending uh, a protester who's doing something wrong like how how should universities be weighing that uh you know obviously i too as a civil libertarian want law enforcement uh to be involved as minimally as possible but i'm sort of wondering like you know universities actually have quite a few tools at their disposal how do you look at that sure yeah i again it's i think c force is a last resort i think they should exhaust every other avenue to end the encampments to end the building occupations to end um, the violence in some cases without having to bring in police on horseback who are going to be lobbying tear gas and perhaps getting into scuffles with the the protesters i mean we have a a, a troubled history in america of calling in police in some cases the national guard we all recall kent state but you have you have another difficult situation right which is these students won't leave the encampment you could do an interim suspension for example but fire also advocates for due process right like nobody should be found um nobody everyone should be innocent until proven guilty so interim suspensions kind of buck that basic principle as well again i just don't envy college and university administrators they have some tough choices to make and they're often trying to speak to to different constituencies but you know, at its core, at some point, um, they're not going to be able to break down these encampments on their own. There will need to be some sort of law enforcement presence if that's if the students won't leave. Yeah, an example of that that you mentioned earlier was what happened at UCLA, where they seem to take a pretty hands-off approach uh, for a while, <laughs> and then these counter protesters came in. And then it, the the people who uh, you know would normally be resisting any sort of policing whatsoever were scolding the administrators for not bringing in the police soon enough. Uh, John, could you play the UCLA clash? Uh, this is these are some um, Israeli supporting Israel supporting counter protesters, basically going into UCLA and tearing down the uh, pro Palestinian encampment. Let's look at that. Go, 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 go
Uh, pretty chaotic. And then, uh, John, could you also just roll the clip of, uh, the, the, I guess, the next day, the protesters are sitting down with the uh, provost from UCLA and complaining to him that the, pol the police were too delayed in stopping their, enc their illegal encampment from being torn down. So could you play that, John? Hundreds of people around Los Angeles, Why including in the encampment yesterday, were calling LAPD. People who were being actively brutalized said, we are calling 911. We're asking for EMTs. We're asking for police. All these things. And they said, we cannot come in yet because we have not gotten the UC's jurisdiction. They have not yet allowed us into the encampment. They said that. <laughs> We called 911 immediately when we saw what was happening, when it was clear that our police were overwhelmed. And, um, and, and they didn't do shit! And again, that's going to come up. They included the situation more dangerous. Well, um, this is not the first time. Remember back in March when we also slept outside? I was there. But look, I need to go. So... You should see what happens to us at 6. You should stay in the last one. Okay. Do they have some sort of respiratory virus circulating in Los Angeles? I'm very confused by the... Oh, there's the ma mask yeah. protesters everywhere. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, um, it's just, you know, 2024 and they're outside. <laughs> yeah, and for our, our <laughs> listeners who couldn't see the video, he, at the end of there, he's kind of doing like the Game of Thrones walk of shame while everyone <laughs> uh, yells shame at him. Um, I, I don't know that it isn't like we've seen these spectacles uh, in the past that it reminds me of like the Nick, Nicholas Christakis, Yale, uh, being surrounded by a kind of a mob who uh, doesn't really want to like how do you have a conversation with a mob really he's there to uh, let them like unload on him and I, I guess I, I give him some credit for being uh, willing to do that but I, I do question like whether that is a productive forum whatsoever yeah I don't think so um, the Nicholas Christakis situation was unfortunate fortunate and i he does deserve credit for having godlike patience uh with the students who were encircling him and berating him uh were called it felt like a struggle session of sorts but your list your listeners might not have been able to see that ucla clip i didn't see a police officer anywhere in that clip and that reminds right. me i i made a, i made a film mighty ira about the life and career of former ACLU executive director Ira Glasser. And a big through line of that film is the Skokie case, which involved a group of neo-Nazis seeking a rally permit in Skokie, Illinois, which was home to then 6,000 Holocaust survivors and the free speech controversy that ensued. And of course, we drew comparisons between th that possible rally, it never ended up happening, um, and Charlottesville, which did end up happening. And one of the things I saw from the Charlottesville footage when I was putting together this film is that, like, you don't see police anywhere. It's essentially a melee between protesters and counter protesters. And, you, you know, no one's surprised that many of them got injured and that one of them was killed. There was just no police presence. And then you look at the footage from the 1970s surrounding Skokie. Again, they didn't, the Nazis didn't go into Skokie, but they did. And it was a brokered agreement go into downtown Chicago and um, Marquette Park, which is right kind of adjacent to to the university of chicago on the south side and you have a phalanx of police officers there to keep the peace mm. so police do have a role in a free society of allowing people to freely exercise their um, expressive rights without it devolving into just kind of vigilante melee and street combat right. like you saw in weimar germany for example Right. Yeah. In Chicago, you know, they just cleared their, or they just brought in police to break down the encampment yesterday, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they had let it stand more or less for quite a while without any intervention. I, I looked into their specific statement uh, about their policy towards the protesters because Chicago, University of Chicago is interesting to me because I believe FIRE has identified them as one of the best free speech campuses uh, in the country, right? Am, am I 
Yeah, their policies are among the strongest and policies don't guarantee good practice, but yes. This this is what they their president put out concerning the encampment. He's uh, they say free expression is the core animating value of the University of Chicago. The general principle we will abide by is to provide the greatest leeway possible for free expression, even expression of viewpoints that some find deeply offensive. We will we only will intervene when what might have been an exercise of free expression blocks the learning or expression of others, or that meaningly disrupts the functioning or safety of the university uh and then he goes on to bring to bring up two example examples one is they allowed a palestinian display of thousands of tiny colored flags for a limited amount of time he said many found this display to be offensive uh but there's no question it was an exercise of free expression it stood for weeks until the end of the approved time at which point the student crew group removed it we adhere to viewpoint neutrality rigorously. And then in their second example, they talk about a group of students and faculty who occupied one of the halls. And after repeated warnings, they were arrested and released. Um, in short, when expression becomes disruption, we act decisively to protect the learning environment. Establishing an encampment clearly violates policies against building structures on campus without prior approval and against overnight sleeping on campus. How common or uncommon is it for that? That's a very clear statement of principles. Is Mm. Chicago the norm in that or are they an exemplar or outlier? Uh, Definitely an outlier. (laughs) uh, Administrative statements aren't uh, paragons of clarity often. And I think one of the things that the University of Chicago did really well there is articulate their core mission and also make it real with, with some examples. Um, so, uh, excuse me, I'm in a interview right now. Um, sorry about that. Watering some plants here. Um, uh, but, but yeah, but they made it concrete with specific examples and that yeah. is really important because otherwise students aren't going to know what, it, what crosses the line between free speech and, um, unprotected conduct. Do you think that makes a difference? Uh, you know, the, an administrative statement is one thing. Do you think it makes a difference in how it plays out from campus to campus to have that sort of clarity. Well, I don't know because I don't know that the students yeah. are going to be too happy with that administrative statement saying that their camp and their encampment isn't protected speech and it needs to be taken down. So, um, does it help? Yes, because I think it makes the administration's case clearer. But one of the things you see is that you just don't have these college and university administrations using their mission as a north star in guiding policy. And University of Chicago is really good at that. Uh, it has the Calvin statement on institutional neutrality, and it's got the Chicago principles on free speech. And in the Calvin statement, it clearly articulates what the mission of the University of Chicago is. It's the preservation, dissemination, and creation of knowledge. And it says that free speech is essential to that process. And the university itself is the host and sponsor of critics, but it is not itself the critic. So it should be neutral on issues of social and political uh, dispute. Contra that with Harvard, in the wake of October 7th, you have Claudine Gay, then the president, write and then rewrite seven different statements on the post-October 7th fallout. If she just asked herself, what is our role here at Harvard? What are we trying to do? Why are we writing statements on things like the October 7th attack on Ukraine, on abortion, on the election of President Donald Trump? Why are we doing that in the first place, right? Harvard had already answered those questions. It says we're not getting involved in these social and political issues. We're not taking stance, stances. My colleague, Will Creeley, draws an apt analogy. He says it's like Odysseus tying himself to the masts as the sirens call for you to do, you know, you know, issue a statement on this, that, or the other thing. I mean, it's smart. It's smart. You can just point to this policy, say, we're not going to do that. And I like um, how flattering that is to all of these social justice protesters, right? As if they're these beautiful sirens in the water whose <laughs> call is so hard to resist. The temptation is so strong. But no, I, I think I think you're correct that there has to be a little bit of this um, fundamental return to what exactly is our role here. I mean, we've okay. also seen this correction a little bit in Silicon Valley. I covered this Uh, quite a bit with the company Basecamp as well as the company Coinbase and the fact that prominent Silicon Valley CEOs have basically said, wow, you know, employee activism has really gotten out of hand. This isn't the thing um, that our shareholders want from us. This isn't the specific niche in the market that we're looking to fill. If you want to be engaged in political activism, this 
you know, cryptocurrency company probably just isn't the place for you. There are many other options available. And again, it just has to do a little bit with this clarity as to like, what is it exactly that we've all assembled to do here in this specific place? Um, in Harvard's case, it's kind of unclear, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Jonathan Haidt talks about how a university needs a central telos, which is like the purpose of the university and that to have uh, multiple different competing interests for the, the central value is like a, a planet spinning on multiple different axes. It just doesn't work. It's not possible, right? So he, he says colleges and universities should ask themselves, are we a social justice university and those values are primary? Or are we a truth-seeking institution, in which case you cannot establish sort, sort of orthodoxy on campus and chill, chill speech in that, that manner? Well, and some of this tension also comes from, you know, in my understanding, the fact that many of these elite universities, Columbia, a notable example, have used in the last few years, at least, the fact that they are activist universities as a little bit of this marketing tactic designed to attract yeah. a certain type of student. And so now I can understand, actually, you know, to give credit to the pro-Palestine protesters, I could understand feeling as though there was a little bit of this bait and switch where Columbia talked this big, big, this big talk about how they wanted to be at the vanguard of some of these social justice causes. And then, well, you're sitting in the encampment and suddenly the police are coming after you. Well, that's a little bit, uh, I think it's fair to say that that is intention with how these universities have built themselves. It's a little bit odd to say, oh, well, we want highly committed, uh, you know, activist students who care about causes that are, um, you know, happening in the world, who care about injustice in the world, and yet don't do it in that way. Which kind of brings me to my other point. So what role is there for civil disobedience. Obviously, civil disobedience would essentially be, you know, many of these students, instead of saying, you know, how dare you send uh, LAPD or NYPD after me, it would be them saying, I'm comfortable bearing the consequences, whether legal or whether a suspension from school, um, because of how deeply, how devoutly I care about this cause. Are there examples of, you know, in the, in the past, the history of campus activism in the US, are there examples of civil disobedience being used effectively? And have we seen any examples of that happening in this current wave? In order to understand whether, I mean, a, a civil disobedience act is, is good or bad, I mean, it just kind of speaks to the underlying motivation for it. Like, do you agree with it or do you not? I think we look at a lot of act, past acts of civil disobedience as being just right we look at the sit-ins at lunch counters in the south the efforts to desegregate bus systems the opposition to the vietnam war i mean those were all very controversial acts in the past that we now look at as being stands on principle that should be admired how we will look back on this current moment and these current student activists who are engaged in civil disobedience I, I don't, it's not for me to, to say, but what I can say is that in the past, you often saw that they were willing to accept the consequences of their actions and yeah. willing to accept arrest. And, you know, it's not, not, it's hard. It's, you don't ever want to paint with broad brushstrokes, but, you know, they understood that what they were doing was illegal. Um, and Although in some cases, uh, I'm not seeing that. Don't, don't the tactics to some degree, aren't they independent of the cause? Because I mean, with, Famously, MLK's maxim was nonviolent resistance mm -hmm. and putting yourself in the position to be the one aggressed against, not aggressing against others or blocking their path to class or yeah. writing graffiti on buildings and causing lots of property damage. Um, I mean, w is there something wrong, like, can we draw a line and say there are certain tactics that even if your cause is just, it's probably not the best way to go, either for advancing your cause or just because you're creating more injustice on in some other realm? Yeah, I think you just drew it. And violence, yeah. I think, is the antithesis of speech. Sigmund Freud is said to have said that civilization was started the day man first cast a stone or first cast a word instead of a stone. So, you know, violence, and, and if you and if you look at the kind of history of political violence, it's often used to shut down speech. Uh, Weimar mm -hmm. Germany, for example, it was used to shut down newspapers, to shut down dissenters of uh, the kind of growing fascist movement. Aryeh Nair, who was the head of the ACLU, during the Skokie case was himself a Holocaust survivor. He escaped mm -hmm. Berlin when he was two years old. And as you might imagine, 
he sorry just so our listeners know the skokie case is where some american nazis marched through a, a, a heavily jewish populated town um as a free speech uh, and the aclu defended them as a free speech uh, matter is that yeah that's correct and i'm actually surprised uh you know how many audiences i talk to who aren't familiar with the background of the skokie case so i appreciate you providing that clarity it actually wasn't a march they per they requested a permit for a rally in front of city hall and they ultimately never ended up doing it um because oh. the case went to the courts and then there was a brokered agreement where they were going to go do it downtown but the aclu took a lot of flack for taking this case and the lead attorney on the case david goldberger was himself jewish Arye nyer the leader of the national aclu at the time was also jewish again i said a holocaust survivor all of his extended family was murdered only those who escaped with him were able to survive and he would get letters from critics saying if if another holocaust comes you know you'll be marching at the front of the line to the gas chambers or mm -hmm. recommending that the aclu adopt a new motto first amendment uber alice and so he wrote this magisterial book called defending my ebony enemy which laid out the case for why he believed that we must defend the rights of speakers we find most abhorrent most offensive and he said that he wouldn't defend the rights of neo-nazis to rally in the town of skokie if he didn't believe that incursions on individual freedom were most likely to cause the next holocaust or the next rise of fascism he said they must be stopped at the outer boundaries angel Mencken talked about how the problem with defending human freedom is that you have to defend the rights of scoundrels because that's where threats to freedom almost first appear so when we're when we're talking about these issues um they can't they can be difficult but it, you know, you have to defend free speech at the margins. Yeah, being yeah. speech permissive is an inoculation against allowing these truly tyrannical authoritarian movements to really, um, you know, get roots, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it seems so trivial, but it's really not because this seemingly trivial exercise of allowing, um, you know, expansive speech permissiveness at all of these different individual levels over and over again, repeatedly, even when you absolutely abhor it. I mean, this is really the bulwark, like the lone bulwark as I see it against us becoming, you know, cultural revolution era China or Weimar Germany. Like it's really stunning to me that people don't see that connection, which makes it easy to sort of look at the pro-Palestine protesters, one of whom I recall was wearing a Hamas headband recently. So like, I absolutely loathe this practice. And yet at the same time, it's like, well, you are in America. I, I suppose you can wear your Hamas headband, can't you? And yeah. I get to counter that with whatever speech I see permissible. But like, this is kind of the deal we have made. And it's an inoculation against actually having to ever live under authoritarianism that we permit this type of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, it's two sides of the coin, right? It's you have to protect the free speech rights of speakers and you have to punish violence where it's being used to also threaten the rights of speakers. You know, think back to right. Frederick Douglass in mm -hmm. 1860. He wrote this famous plea for free speech in Boston. Why did he write it? Because a group of uh, pro-slavery individuals created a mob and stormed his abolitionist meeting so you know and and he talked about how the free speech is two sides of one coin it's the right of the speaker to speak and the listener to listen and if you have mob censorship efforts that are go unchecked then that's a threat to freedom as well i wanted to look at the to think a little bit about the effect that these protests might be having, because that's also a question about when when you think about the tactics of a protest movement, um, are they actually effective? Are they changing people's minds? Um, and to, to kind of start to get into that question, I was digging through some of the polling data, both on the protests and on Israel, Palestine itself. And um, the uh, Axios and Generation Lab did a survey last week of about 1,200 college students. So these are all college students reflecting on what is going on on their campus. And um, one of the questions here is, which of the following do you think is acceptable for students to do as a part of their protest? Uh, select all that apply. And um, 33% say that uh, agree that occupying campus buildings um, is is acceptable. Only 10% say blocking students who support Israel. So those videos we saw earlier, not popular among students. Um, refusing an order to disperse an encampment uh, has 42% support. 
um, and none of the above uh, is 44 percent. So uh, it, it looks like it's there's a kind of sizable minority that endorse these tactics, but not not the majority. Uh, and then digging further here. How do you feel about the tent encampments that have materialized across colleges campus uh, across college campuses which seek to boycott and protest against Israel? And uh, twenty percent, twenty seven percent support them strongly. Uh, Eighteen percent support them a bit. So that's uh, forty five percent have some support, uh, and then twenty four percent don't really support them, and then thirty percent are neutral. So a pretty divided picture there on this. Um, and then last couple things here. Do you think your college should boycott, divest, and sanction um, groups uh, that are based in Israel? Uh, this is the central demand of the protest movement. And 46% say yes. And a majority, 54%, don't actually agree with the objectives of the protesters. And lastly, do you think students who destroyed property uh, vandalized or illegally occupied buildings should be held accountable by their university. 45% say yes, definitely. Um, and a smaller 36% say yes, probably. So, you know, well over, uh, or over 80% believe that this is punishable behavior. Does any of that surprise you? Uh, or, you know, what, what's your reaction to that data? Nico? Yeah, well, it doesn't really surprise me. I mean, we recall the the silent majority during the 60s protests as well. I, the thing that I, I am most concerned about when we're talking about effects of these protests on college campuses is that to the extent that folks are successful in arguing that encampments, round the clock encampments, are protected speech, that blocking access to open areas of campus is protected speech, that that building occupations is protected speech. It's just going to turn people off from free speech because I think at, at, in people's guts, they think that, well, this isn't what I had in mind when I was talking mm. about free speech, this sort of kind of devolution of a college or university campus into being non-functional. Um, and I, we saw, we did some polling after Charlottesville, for example, where the conflict that occurred there was perceived by many to be blamed on free speech and our argument is no it's blamed on poor police performance not doing their job to come in and, and separate protesters and counter protesters and indeed heather hire's mother susan bro was asked this direct question do you blame free speech for your daughter's death heather hire was ran over by a car uh, murdered and she said no i blame the police. We cannot blame free speech and we can't use my, the death of my daughter as a justification for further censorship. The other effect I'm concerned about is the involvement of the federal government in doing, yeah. doing more speech policing on college campuses. I know you guys are all libertarians over there at Reason, so I imagine you have the same concern with me. But this all started in part on December 5th when Elise Stefanik browbeat the presidents of Penn, Harvard, and MIT into answering a question about Jew Jewish genocide that was disingenuous. And we can dive into that if you want. But, um, you know, yes. they, the, the president of Columbia, when she was called to testify a few months later, did not make the same uh, mistake as those presidents then. Well, and the Columbia situation is interesting because it's a little bit of this accident of timing, right? The Columbia president, if I recall correctly, Dr. Shafik had a prior engagement that made it so that um, she did not testify at the same time as those other college presidents. And that allowed additional time to prepare and to understand what would happen. But to some degree, what we did have was a sitting member of Congress attempting to really, um, you know, put some fingers on the scale uh, with attempting to dictate to these universities how they ought to handle um, speech on their campus in a way that like I found I under like the, the crux of what Stefanik was getting to, I think, is very fair of like, hey, there's a massive speech hypocrisy issue happening mm -hmm. on these elite campuses where some speech is, you know, so profoundly threatening um, and so microaggressing that we must ensure that it never happens on these campuses. But then some pretty ugly speech in, in this current context is permitted. But at the same time, it's totally inappropriate for a sitting member of Congress to be attempting to dictate from on high, quite literally what these universities do. Yeah, especially when you're a member of the Free Speech Caucus or Campus Free Speech Caucus, as Elise Stefanik is. Yeah, no, I don't- No, I don't private universities are not public. Like, I think there's there's sure. interesting lines to draw here because especially at universities, we have lots of different um, 
you know, specific ways that they're they function. But I was I was shocked by how so much of the right greeted Stefanik's hectoring of these university presidents as if it was some sort of win. When in reality, like that's kind of not the precedent that I want to be set. No, and I agree with, with what you say, Liz, about the hypocrisy of these colleges or universities. I think that must be said. I mean, you have Harvard, for example, putting in its freshman orientation materials that fat phobia is a form of violence. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, when they're asked about whether calls for Jew Jewish genocide are prohibited under the student code of conduct, they say context matters. Um, I will say as a free speech advocate, context does matter. So let's talk about the context of that hearing, right? Leading yeah. up to let that. Me, before we talk about that, actually, let me just roll a little bit of uh, footage from that hearing. I just oh, yeah, added please. it to the room. Uh, John, if you want to play that video that I just uh, popped in. To find let's do it. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. I want to follow up on my colleague, Rep Wahlberg's question regarding Professor Joseph Massad. So let me be clear, uh, President, that he was spoken to. Who spoke with him? Uh, he was spoken to by his head of department and his dean. And what was what was he told? I was not in those conversations. I think. But you're not aware that that language was unacceptable. What was he told? That that language was unacceptable. And were there any other enforcement actions taken? Any other disciplinary actions taken? In his case, he has not repeated anything like that ever since. Does he I need to say, repeat stating that the massacre of Israeli civilians was awesome? Does he need to repeat his participation in an unauthorized pro-Hamas demonstration on April 4th? Mm -hmm. You know, Professor David Scheiser talked about, Schizer talked about the lack of enforcement. Do you agree that this is an issue with a lack of enforcement when the policy of Columbia specifically stated on, on April 7th April 5th said, I want to make clear that it is absolutely unacceptable for any member of this community to promote the use of terror or violence, mm -hmm. and yet you have no action, no disciplinary action. Do you agree with how the university has handled this? Yeah, we have uh, 4,700 faculty at Columbia, most of whom spend all of their time dedicated to teaching their students. But I'm talking about the faculty have, members yeah. who are supporting terror, and it's not just that case. Like all right. Uh, why does that exchange disturb you, Nico? Well, because Elise Stefanik is essentially calling for Columbia University in violation of its own policies to investigate a faculty member for their clearly protected speech. Uh, it's a clear threat to academic freedom. You know, if you roll back, mm -hmm. so let, let, you know, let's talk about Claudine Gay uh, of Harvard answered the question from Elise Stefanik whether calls for Jewish genocide or violate the student code of conduct that immediately followed a discussion about whether intifada and from the river to the sea palestine will be free these chants are calls for jewish genocide and the the sense of the room at that point was that yes they were at least that's the sense of congress is that yes they yeah. were and so i think that's what she was asking when she asked the presidents of these various schools um for their their positions but you you know when they all respond context matters it's true. Whenever you're talking about unprotected speech, context does matter. You do need to analyze the facts. So just think about what the standard you're setting if you have this abstract call for genocide that's prohibited. Well, what you're going to get is the situation you get on campus right now where each side is accusing the other side of genocide. They're going to wield this genocide speech code to go after political opponents, supporters of Israel's war in Gaza, opponents of Israel's war in Gaza. You're going to see folks who uh, oppose gender affirming care be accused of creating a genocide against trans kids. You're going to get pro-lifers accused of, um, well, you're going to have pro-lifers called pro-choice advocates, um, you know, Supporting genocide enablers. Yeah. yeah, because it's a genocide yeah, against it, the unborn. It's also, you know, we've seen these university presidents dropping like flies after they appear before Congress. And so she's up there, the Columbia president, uh, walking on eggshells, kind of at least rhetorically capitulating to yeah. these uh, Congress members. And it's concerning to me in the same way that like the social media relationship with Congress is concerning, where maybe they're not passing a law telling uh, Mark Zuckerberg how to moderate Facebook, but they're exerting a lot of pressure on them in this. They're they're uh, pushing down on this other pressure point, and there's already precedent for people getting booted. So this is a form of almost coercion it seems what like where to me it's like why does con why is it congress's business whatsoever how columbia runs its campus and 
uh, staffs its faculty. That it, it seems it's it seems very um, like performative in a really dangerous way. Yeah, I think the argument on the other side would be that, for example, uh, colleges are bound by the Civil Rights Act of 1965 to not yeah. enable sex discrimination under Title IX or race, color, and national origin discrimination under Title Six, And this is them just doing their oversight duty to investigate clear acts of discrimination. But I would argue that the things that they're investigating in many of these uh, situations, and at least the things they're asking these college and university presidents involve core protected political speech that should not be excluded under the Civil Rights Act of 1965. But then you have the president of Columbia out of a sheer act of self-preservation, it seems, capitulating, saying they're going to investigate faculty members, capitulating, saying, yes, calls for Jewish genocide are prohibited under their student code of conduct, the implication being that an intifada and from the river to the sea is prohibited. So I don't like any of it. Yeah. Um, and I think it will create a chilling effect. Well, let's talk about the, the bill that just passed the House. Um, the... Um, here it is, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act of 2023, because this relies on that those civil rights laws that you were talking about. It's basically saying, it's trying, uh, my understanding is it's trying to add this definition of anti-Semitism uh, to the civil right to, let's see, what is it? Uh, the definition of anti-Semitism adopted on May 26, 2016 by the IRHA, uh, will uh, can be a factor in deciding whether there's been a violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and the Department of Education shall take into consideration this definition of anti-Semitism. I've pulled up the definition here. It's also uh, interestingly based yeah. off of not just an individual status as a Jew, but also their perceived status uh, as an ethnic Jew, which I think is an interesting component, right? I mean, this is a very, in my view, an overly broad definition that we're talking about. Right. I mean, th this is what they're they're pulling from the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Association. And um, most of these bullet point uh, alliance, thank you, are most most of these bullet points are like, I would agree fully, like these are anti-Semitic beliefs uh, accusing the Jews of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust, accusing, um, let's see, accusing Jews of being responsible uh, for real or imagined wrongdoing committed by a single Jewish person or group. Um, but then there's things like uh, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, example by claiming the existence of a state of, of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor, or drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Um, I think both of those are <laughs> ill-advised and wrong um, rhetorical moves, but um, like is making these historical comparisons we're now going to fold into civil rights as a civil rights violation that's worthy of termination or suspension um i know that you were on social media kind of pointing out some problems with this law what what is your issue with the anti-semitism awareness act well as ryan grimm the journalist pointed out it's a law breaking law it breaks itself right so it, you have all these examples of criticism of Israel that are seen to be anti-Semitic and would be enforced under civil rights law. But then you have this last example of anti-Semitism that says holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the state of Israel is, is anti-Semitic. So like the, the whole law is connecting Judaism to the state of Israel. And then it says you cannot hold Jews collectively collectively responsible for the state of Israel. So it's like in, internally inconsistent, but even broader than that, speaking to the first amendment, concerns. We've opposed this. This has been around for like nine years. It's never gotten any traction of Congress in Congress. I think we can all understand why it's getting some traction now. But the author of this IHRA definition, Kenneth Stern, himself opposes using it as a legal mechanism to police speech. He said it was meant to create like some sort of consistent definition for U European data collectors to write reports. Nowhere else in anti-discrimination <laughs> law do they lay out specific examples of prohibited speech. We don't see it in anti-black racism. We don't see it in sexism. So this would be the first time that you have examples of otherwise clearly protected speech being excluded um, from protection under civil rights law. I mean, it, it would be struck down in court if it were, were to pass and it were to be applied 
to students, but nevertheless, it's going to create a chilling effect by just being on the books. If you risk losing all of your federal funding, which is the only recourse under Title VI, it's never happened before, but colleges and universities are fearful of it, um, you're going to err on the side of caution when you hear folks on your campus out from the river to the sea or intifada. Do you think that will be a new front in the culture wars, the pulling of funding? Because that's really the lever that the federal government can pull. And we would be remiss not to note over the course of doing this podcast that, you know, for better or worse, many of these universities, the public universities especially, are funded by taxpayers. Um, will we begin to see members of Congress basically not just threatening to pull federal funding for these universities that engage in, um, you know, practices they dislike or support the wrong side in their view? Um, is this sort of the new front in the culture wars? Will things get worse from here? Well, I th think that's always been the implication when you see the, all this like robust pressure put on college and universities is that they're going to pull their federal funding again. But it infrequently happens, right? Like it's always the threat. But it's no, not. I'm not aware of it ever happening. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it is a threat. And I think it'll continue to be wielded. But, I, you know, I'm not sure how seriously colleges and universities actually take this threat or if there's like other reasons why they hmm. um, acquiesce or genuflect to these concerns. Um, you know, I, I am just more broadly concerned about the chilling effect it'll create, because even if they're not pulling your federal funding, an investigation in and of itself can be a form of punishment. They're super intent. And then Columbia is undergoing a Title VI investigation as we speak. Um, yeah, they're death super by interested. bureaucracy is another form of punishing. I think that that's an important yeah. point for people to take away. I mean, how, how do you make the case to supporters of something like the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act or just people who are generally turned off by what the pro-Palestinian protesters are doing and don't agree with their cause, where it's tough for them to swallow the sudden love of free speech be that some of these uh, university presidents are professing when the past 10 years were all about trigger warnings and um, like hypersensitivity. Like we all saw that come out and now there seems to be a flip. You know, FIRE is admirably one of those organizations that just stands strong no matter who the aggrieved party is. But like, how do you persuade people who are just, they see this as like rank hypocrisy and uh, that they they're tired of playing that game. Yeah. Well, you first acknowledge that it is rank hypocrisy that you've seen censorship on college campuses be wheeled against conservatives, libertarians, you know, all around political dissenters on campus for decades. And it's ramped up in the past decade. So you have to acknowledge that. But if you see it as, as a problem, maybe you use this as a moment to try and right the ship. What was it? Rahm Emanuel who said in every crisis is an opportunity. And as civil libertarians, we've always got to call balls and strikes on free speech, right? And just because they've been hi hypocritical in the past isn't a new moment to like come in and improve censorship. Like, I don't know what the al other alternative is. And I think you would be making a serious mistake by supporting things like the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act and because it'll just generate more censorship envy, right? So now you enshrine certain examples that touch core political speech in anti-discrimination law. Um, involving anti-Semitism, you're going to see folks who are concerned about anti-Black racism or sexism or other forms of discrimination then calling for their own examples, right? And Ira Glasser, who I mentioned before, the former executive director of the ACLU, tells a story about how in the 1970s, the National Union of Students in England wanted to pass a hate speech code to uh, oppose uh, racist speech. And they solicited a bunch of student organizations in that country to support them, be co-sponsors of it, and they got the Zionist student organization to do it. Well, what happened a few years later after that hate speech code was passed? Zionism was perceived to be racist hate speech, and it was used against the Zionist student organization. So you have to be careful what you wish for. Censorship has a way of acting, as Ira says, like poison gas. It might seem like an effective tool when the enemy's in your sights, but the wind has a way of shifting. And I've been heartened, at least with the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, to see a lot of Jewish groups come out in opposition to it. I think there was an editorial and tablet where the headline was, Not in Our Name. So yeah. there is a broad coalition here. What's your attitude towards the non-governmental effects? Uh, I guess the, the like the non-governmental countermeasures to 
political speech that that we've seen going on, particularly in this conflict. Um, it's manifested in things like the docks truck. I think I've got a, a slide of that. This was um, shortly after uh, the October 7th attack. A bunch of Harvard students signed on to a letter that uh, people interpreted as uh, way far too sympathetic to uh, the Palis uh, the uh, Hamas's cause, and um, went around you, with this truck. Do you dispute yeah. the characterization, Zach? That it was too too simple. I, I no, not not really. Um, okay. I, I, it's not it's not a letter I would have signed. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think it was, and, was it that letter that said that they hold Israel entirely responsible? Yeah, for what happened exactly. On October 7th? Yeah, yeah. So then the the reply to that was to plaster their faces on this uh, truck uh, and drive around campus to shame them. Um, more recently. Um, this came from our previous guest, Aaron Sabarium, uh, posted about how uh, some judges have signed on to a letter saying that they will not hire anyone who joins the Columbia University community, whether it's undergraduates or law students, beginning with the entering class of 2024. So they're creating a blacklist for Columbia just based on the way Columbia's administration has conducted itself uh, through this ordeal. Do you have any opinion on to like, like are these sorts of things good, bad, or neutral from a free speech perspective? Well, it depends on any given situation. Like the Columbia blacklist, I, I'm just, as a civil libertarian, not a big fan of collective punishment. Like it would suck to be the conservative or libertarian student who would want to go work for one of these judges. You get into a good law school, you attend, you have no control over what the administration does. And all of a sudden you can't get a clerkship. As for the doxing truck, doxing is interesting because a lot of what we perceive as doxing is core protected speech, but it can also have a chilling effect on speech, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it's meant to intimidate and shut, shut folks down. Also, is it doxing if these names, I mean, were th these names are publicly associated with these organizations and the organizations were publicly signatories to this letter. Mm -hmm. And so doxing, at least to me, conjures up an image of um, providing identifying details as to one's home address or something mm -hmm. along those lines, um, or, you know, in a student context, which dorm they live in. But to some degree, yeah. like this is sifting through publicly available information and then displaying the publicly available information in a very nasty way. Yes, right? the shaming like, truck might be a better name for well, it. Well, you have this negative connotation associated with doxing. So if you're one of these students or one of the students who's sympathetic to this letter, you you would, you know, ascribe this as doxing. But I, you know, I generally don't think naming people who are publicly associated with certain groups to be to be doxing. That said, I was a president of a student organization in college. Student organizations all that aren't that very aren't that organized. Um, often you'll be you'll attend one meeting and be said to be a member so that you can get registered student organization status, but you're really not a member. Yeah, you so throw five dollars of dues their way, and suddenly you're associated with them in the eyes of Bill Ackman, who I believe funded this doxing truck, right? Or even less than that, right? Like you attend yeah. a meeting and all of a sudden you're a member of the student organization because you need to have a certain number of members in order to get that registered status. So students will kind of fudge with the numbers. Um, but yeah, yeah so I, I, I wouldn't have done this sort of thing with uh, student groups just because I know how messy the student groups are. Um, yeah. But yeah. It reminds me of when I was in high school and I was hellbent on starting a, uh, a high school libertarians organization. And I had a few dude friends who were helping me with this. Naturally, I was the, the lone lady libertarian as far as the eye could see. So we decided to just sign up all of the dudes who were on the soccer team with them. And so suddenly all of these four <laughs> soccer players just had an endless stream of libertarian content to their inboxes. But it's truly, I mean, these are not particularly, to your point, these are not particularly precise definitions uh, at all. No. To this day, many of those soccer players are, of course, still libertarians. The indoctrination <laughs> worked perfectly. But no, I mean, but there's also this question of like, you know, I always struggle with this, um, you know, as a free speech absolutist and a free speech maximalist of like, well, when you do have a truck like that, that is uh, driving around campus, the obvious like what this is clearly inviting is these people being targeted it's essentially this form of public shaming um i think that the causes that some of these people were endorsing and the verbiage that they're using in terms of holding the state of israel entirely responsible for you know the horrific murders and rapes of october 7th per perpetrated by a terrorist group hamas like i i think it's a really really vile thing to believe and a vile thing to say out loud but what this effectively does is invites harassment to these people. Um, and it's it's something where I'm, I'm not 
I see public shaming as falling into this really awkward category where I think it ought to be legal and permitted, and it, it is, but you know, it invites a lot of nasty speech chilling um, retribution that I don't see as just and that, frankly, I would imagine makes it harder for people to begin to engage in these questions and, and display a certain sense of humility as to, OK, well, are these views that I currently hold, are they actually true? Are they actually just like to what degree does this just um, make the situation on campus and make these individuals' lives so worse that it doesn't actually invite self-reflection. Like it's not substantive engagement with their beliefs. It's just a means of making them uh, persona non grata on campus. How do you look at that, Nico? Well, no, I agree with you. I would never want public shaming or cancel culture, so to speak, uh, within private institutions to be outlawed under, under the First Amendment. But I do worry that you know, cancel culture like expression uh, undermines the sort of civil and robust discourse that you want to see in society writ large. Like there's, there's a reason in fire's mission statement and it says nothing about the first amendment. Like we want a society in which thought experimentation, talking us across lines of difference, devil's advocacy, where, you know, where our first instinct and in response to speech we don't like, isn't to figure out some way to shut it down or brow people beat someone into silence, but to rather meet that speech with more speech and try and create dialogue across lines of difference. I mean, that's how the democratic process is supposed to work, but we're living in a culture increasingly, and our colleague Greg Lukianoff points this out, it's like, I grew up with idioms that taught me how to live, like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me, things like to each their own, or it's a free country. I don't hear those idioms as much as I used to. Maybe it's because my kids are three years old and one year old. Um, so they're, they're just not throwing those things around the playground, but like it does, it does speak to whether our norms have shifted. And now we're, we're trying to, as, as my colleague, Greg likes to say, win arguments without actually winning arguments through spilled speech chilling actions. Is there any antidote to that? Because it really only seems to be escalating to me. Like it, it, doesn't seem as though cancel culture has gone away. It's only that now both sides have adopted it. Like yeah, the, it's, it's being used right. as a web. Yeah, I mean, the the right famously, you know, uh, was able to wage successful boycotts for the first time against certain products, which is a sort of different category. But now also, you know, you, and when you think of the term cancel culture, you don't think of it being wielded against a left wing cause like Palestinian resistance, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, um, I know that, could you tell me a little bit actually about the history of like the Palestinian, like how Pal the Palestinian movement has been treated on campus? I understand that they are one of the groups historically that's been targeted for a long time. Yeah, I will say you mentioned the the boycotting of certain private yeah. institutions, retailers like Target, for example, because they sell LGBT merchandise. I mean, it's more than just cancel culture in that case. You have state AGs sending them letters and accusing them of violating their fiduciary duty, which is even more speech chilling. But with regard to yeah. the you know Israel uh, Palestinian conflict, and I, you know I use those words deliberately. After October seventh, I sent an email to our, our entire staff. It says. We've seen this sort of flare up on campus surrounding this issue before. It's where we see tensions is at the highest. Uh, we have a phrase within fire. We'll drive this thing and this bus into the wall if we have to, if it remain means remaining principles and principled. And like a lot of the pressures that we receive to not remain principled surround the Israel Palestinian conflict. But like even using the word Palestine for example, in our commentary about it, is sort of a political statement because the, Palestine is not mm -hmm. an internationally recognized state. So are you, and using that word to describe the Israel-Palestinian conflict, uh, essentially suggesting that you think Palestine should be a state? So like we, we have to, we're walking on eggshells when we're talking about it so that we can play things down the middle on the First Amendment. But yeah, I mean, this uh, the Students for Justice in Palestine has long been a target of administrators on college campuses. We've worked with their national group where we have common cause to defend First Amendment rights on these college campuses. So it, it came as no surprise to us when um, October 7th happened that this thing was going to get hot and, and remains hot. Do you yeah, think, so. on, on that note, do you think we're headed toward a Kent State-esque suppression, like violent suppression of protesters? Many people have talked about this um, online and in editorials, and I am obviously hoping that that does not happen, but it also doesn't appear to have the markings of that type of thing. 
I, I hope mean, not. Yeah. I mean, nobody's but gunning for that, right? No, but nobody's gunning for that. Use the pun. And I think, I think a lot of college and university administrators are just trying to run out the clock and get past finals and commencement season and to see how yeah. things are shaping up before they determine what their next move is with some of these encampments. So yeah, does this just go away during summer break? Is that kind of how this resolves? Well, I, unless these students who are participating in the encampment to the extent they have summer jobs or internships and they're not taking classes, like want to remain there, maybe they're that, that committed to the cause that they would say, you know, I'm not going to my summer job. I'm not going to my internship, but um, yeah, you know, it would probably be more sparsely attended. But I also just don't think the war between Israel and Hamas is going anywhere. You know, you know, Israel is invading Rafa right now. So where will things be in September when the semester and the school year resume? I don't know, but I have to imagine if it's still going on, the encampments are still going to be there. Is there a component to this that's actually a little bit offensive? Meaning specifically in the Gaza Strip right now, we have refugee encampments. We have people, you know, mass displacement of people, people literally starving, inadequate medical care, um, people living in tent cities all over uh, the desert. And then now we have 10 cities uh, among some of the most privileged kids in the entire world. Those who are lucky be, lucky enough to be born with United States passports, in many cases, who uh, are from families of means, who have the abilities to, to attend schools like Columbia and UCLA, who have their freaking Erewhon smoothies in their encampments with them, who are wearing kefias as you know fashion accessories, but really weren't really familiar with the term up until about two months ago. Is this role playing? Is this like, is is there one perspective? Not not talking about the legality of what they're doing, but is the fact that they're recreating these tent cities that are actually legitimately happening um, in the Gaza Strip right now? Is there something offensive about this form of protest? They would probably argue that it's one of the reasons that they're doing it is to you know show solidarity with these um, refugee camps in in the Gaza Strip. So, but, but is there you, any material aid given? I mean, it, it's like I know many of the encampments do have signs that say something at the bottom, which is like something along the lines of "Never lose sight of Gaza." Mm -hmm. And you know, I know that this has been a theme that like I'm not the first person to bring up. Many of these activists, to give them credit, have really grappled with this. But to some degree, especially when you see the U.S. media fixation with what's happening at Columbia with Hamilton Hall, um, or the you know skirmishes at UCLA, I, I begin to feel a little bit icky inside, where I'm like, okay, well, we're just using this, and we're actually ignoring the coverage of the ceasefire deal possibly being worked out, or the Rafa invasion, and it's like we have this extreme navel gazing. Um, ultra American obsession with litigating things that are happening at these very fancy places in the United States, but not the actual extreme desperation that's happening far away. Yeah. I, th I do think people see it as a little bit tone deaf, for example, when you're engaged in an unlawful occupation of Hamilton Hall at Columbia <laughs> University, for example, and you ask that food be allowed to be brought in. I think one commentator said it's like this revolution will be catered. Or you have uh, the free press reported this morning, I believe that that janitor or custodian who was got involved in that tussle with a protester in Hamilton Hall, um, that that protester, which was, was allegedly kind of a, a trust fund kid who owned a two point three million dollar brownstone in New York City, right? So you to know, be you fair, have... all the brownstones are two point three million, right? I mean, <laughs> you can't really find a cheap brownstone. Look, <laughs> I'd like one. So if anyone has one out of there and just wants to give it, to you me say two point three take... million brownstone. I'm like, ah, oh, good deal, a good deal, <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Yeah, I mean, that might have been what it sold for, for before inflation hit. I don't know. <laughs> I think you could also look at this from the other perspective, which is that um, just because there's sometimes some goofy or out of touch or like, you know, really dumb protesters, it doesn't it's not really uh, a comment on the justice or injustice of their underlying cause. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like, to just start to close this out, to look at public opinion towards the Gaza-Israel mm -hmm. war itself and speculate as to whether this is shifting it one way or another or having no effect at all. Um, I've got um, this from YouGov uh, asking from and May on May first and second, do Americans support or oppose uh, the the protests? Uh, Twenty eight percent of U.S. adults strongly or somewhat support. 
and 47% strongly or somewhat oppose. And then there's 24% who are not sure. And if you look down, you see there's huge divides between 18 to 44 year olds where 40% strongly support versus 45 and over 62% strongly or somewhat oppose. Um, and then also some obvious religious divides where 75% of Muslims support these, 72% of Jews oppose them. Um, for the Middle East situation itself, there's a similar age divide. Uh, for 18, uh, it, it, uh, this question from Gallup asks, in the Middle East situation, are your sympathies more with Israelis or more with the Palestinians? For 18 to 34-year-olds, 45% of them sympathize with Palestinians. For 55 and over, 63% sympathize with Israelis. And uh, 35 to 54-year-olds are 46% sympathize with Israelis. 24% with Palestinians. Um, the best part about then, that is the neither yeah. category. Like, can you imagine being like, ah, oh, the refugees in Gaza, the Israelis who had their family members raped, and you're like, nah, no sympathy for any of these people. <laughs> <laughs> like, what type of misanthrope do you have to be? <laughs> and um, there's also from the Pew Research Center, Americans' views of why, how, why and how Israel and Hamas are fighting. Um, I found this interesting just because, um, you know, a, a large majority agree that Israel's reasons for fighting Hamas are valid uh, somewhat or completely. But on the question of the way Israel is carrying out its response to the October 7th attack, it's much more divided, evenly divided. Um, and then the way Hamas carried out its attack on October 7th, most people agree that's completely unacceptable. Um, I mean, do you have any theory or insight as to whether the student movements, um, or I guess the protests more broadly, are are having an effect? And like, when when do what kind of effects in the past have these kind of you know on the street movements actually have ha have had in advancing the cause that they're standing for? I'm just a lonely, lowly uh, and lonely free speech advocate. So I'm not a yeah. statistician or public opinion pollster, but I, I will say at least anecdotally from our work that there seems to be a lot of opposition to the protests. My colleague, Will Creeley, went on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, which is like <laughs> this call and show essentially, and it's famous for its uh, long-winded and sometimes fun and funny call in guests um it's a goal of mine to go on that show one time it's like the paradigmatic it's like the perfect example of what it means to be in dc uh, but most of the calls were from people who opposed the protests and that's what we hear mm -hmm. from from donors and there's a lot of questions around like well is this really free speech they keep saying it's free speech is it really free speech and then this speaks to what i was saying earlier before which is i'm worried that some of these unlawful building occupations or encampments will be seen as protected under the first amendment because that's the argument that the protesters are making and you can't blame them for making it right make all the arguments you can um and people are just going to not be able to get on on board with that so i do worry about that as a long-term long-term consequence yeah with the in regards to the question of whether it's um is affecting attitudes towards the war itself it looks to me like that there's probably much larger forces at play than whether people are um, annoyed by campus protesters at Columbia or not. Um, it, it seems like the, the conduct of the war and the, the death toll and um, the way that it's playing out in the media, it seems to be having a much bigger impact than um, the encampments or I think that's probably right the, yeah. on the street protests. Yeah. Well, but um, I, I would, yeah. I would counter that a little bit and say like, I do wonder to what degree do, engaging in the, um, Israel Palestine conflict light as in engaging with the campus protest dimension is something that yeah. is keeping this front and center uh, in people's minds in a way that mm. we cannot expect everybody to be paying attention to the Rafa ground invasion right now and to be nerds about this the way that the rest of us might be. 
And mm -hmm. so for some people, the college campus version and the fact that it's very in their faces, right? For some parents of yeah. students whose commencements um, were scrapped entirely, this was maybe something that was not front of mind. Mm -hmm. And now their plans to attend a commencement next weekend um, have totally changed. Yeah. You know, the, the Google Calendar invite has been, um, you know, done away with. And so I am curious about whether or not this is actually kind of effective in terms of keeping yeah. this in front of It's people. raising the salience and maybe moving people out of that don't know, not sure category and answering those questions at least is forcing them to think about it. And it's not engagement necessarily at a particularly high level, but I would imagine that many protesters feel as though it is a job well done. So, I mean, yeah. credit where due if that is their goal. Yeah. Yep. Um, Nico, I want to ask you um, one last broad question about campus free speech, and then the final question of the show. Uh, the that that question is just like, what is Fire's assessment of the state of free speech on campus right now? Kind of in a you know recent historical lens. Like, are we at a high point, low point, somewhere in the middle? I started at Fire in 2012, and I worked for Greg Lukianoff and worked on the communications team a little bit. And I used to, you know, used to get really excited when one reporter would report on our issues and, you know, over a couple day span, this last week at fire, we had a thousand media mentions last year. We had 14,000 The year prior to that, we had like something like 4,000. So people are interested in these issues. They're coming to fire to talk about them. We peg the heightening salience or awareness of free speech to when Ray Kelly, the former police commissioner of uh, New York City, was shouted down at Brown University in, I believe, late 2013 or early 2014. I believe it was late 2013. From there, shout downs, microaggression, policing, disinvitation started to take off. In 2017, you started seeing violence, for example, fi uh, Molotov cocktails thrown at the University of California, Berkeley to prevent Milo Yiannopoulos from speaking, uh, attack at Middlebury when Charles Murray was set to speak there. And we keep waiting for this issue to recede again into the background, but it hasn't. And it's mm -hmm. only become more salient. 2020 was one of the biggest years for our work that we've ever seen in the wake of the George Floyd protests. And we thought that was going to be the high watermark. But then October 7th happened, the congressional testimony in December happened, and now you're seeing the encampments and it's just not going away. So I'm done predicting it's, if it's going to get better or worse. Um, the last decade is just a story of it always being present. Damn Hamas. <laughs> Damn Hamas. Why would they do this to us? Uh, so we're adding a, we're going to start asking everyone a final question on this show. And you're the first guest of honor to answer this question for us. So to wrap us up, I just want to ask you, Nico, what's a question more people should be asking? With regard to free speech, I think the question folks should be asking themselves is a question that Christopher Hitchens asked to a Canadian audience uh, about a decade and a half ago before he passed away in debating free speech protections, he asked the audience, who would you empower with the authority to decide for you what books you can read, for you what movies you can watch, for you what speeches you can hear? There's laws on the books all across the world that assume that we would entrust somebody with these responsibilities. He asked the audience to raise its hand. If anyone knew of someone with whom they would entrust this responsibility, nobody raised their hands. But yet you have a big proportion of the, the world who tries to justify speech restrictions every day. If they can't name the person they would entrust to enforce those restrictions, then maybe they shouldn't support them in the first place. So when I'm going to college and university campuses, I'm taking a playbook out of Hitchens and I'm asking them that very question. If you support censorship, then you support someone enforcing that censorship. It might be Barack Obama today. You might like him. You might trust him. But next year, it might be Donald Trump. Do you trust Donald Trump? to enforce that. So if people ask themselves that question squarely, not separate the law from the person who is tasked with enforcing the law, I think we'll come down on the side of free speech a lot more often. Nico Perino, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Zach and Liz. Welcome to another segment of Just Ask Us Questions in which you guys submit us, reader, listener, viewer mail um, to the email address justaskingquestions at reason.com.
Here we have an email from Ronnie that appears to be very flattering toward me. So I love this yeah. type of mail. I'm not um, even named in this. I'm just going to stay quiet. <laughs> uh, Liz, though I don't have a question for you, I do have plenty of validation for you. I have been a libertarian, capital L, since listening to Gene Burns on the radio since the 90s. But as I grow older, I have grown more nuanced in my capital L libertarian positions. This week's podcast, Dave Smith and Chris Feynman, has only driven that point home. I remember towing the LP line of completely open borders with the caveat of, as long as it doesn't cost me anything personally, I don't care who comes here. Well, that has changed. We've reached the limit of how many people we can reasonably accommodate. Sponsorship by employers or family seems like a reasonable path at this point. However, I'm open to listening to all ideas similar to your guests this week. My point being, the podcast makes me think. And that is probably one of my favorite traits. I especially like that people like you challenge the guests on all the podcasts I've heard so far with a real world reasoning that took me 25 years to learn. I think the world is in need of reasoned thought for more people like you, blah, 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 blah. Thank you. That is so very kind. I think that our reaction to the immigration debate, at least, you know, I won't speak for Zach, but for me, it comes from a sense of... <laughs> I would say I, I would say I, I frequently and consistently feel kind of disgruntled by a lot of the immigration topic engagement that I see from a lot of corners of libertarian world. Um, it's disturbing to me how many people will just kind of, you know, slap a Cato paper onto their argument and call it a day. And I'm not really sure, you know, although the Cato Institute does really excellent work on this, and I personally read a lot of Alex Narasta and David Beer. I am not sure that that sort of lazy approach is necessarily the thing that is going to be winning over people who have um, concerns that they feel are legitimate about public disorder and crime and safety in the U.S. and issues with, you know, awkward temporary um, adjustments in the labor force and a sense that, well, wait a second, we already have housing supply problems. And so will those problems be exacerbated if we let a whole bunch of people in? And then possibly the argument that I'm most sympathetic to which is, especially for New Yorkers like myself, for whatever reason, our city has declared itself um, essentially open to all immigrants and they can come here and have free shelter for 30 days at a time and prepaid debit cards and all of these different things that are really being paid for by taxpayers like me with no real limitation on who can receive them. To me, the bill always comes due and this use of the welfare state seems really inappropriate. I would much prefer relying on private charity to do this type of ministry. I'm not sure if this was ever really put up to a vote. This was all done by consent degree, decree many years ago in New York. And I think that many people are sort of, I wonder whether there will be a political backlash, one that's currently brewing where New Yorkers are concerned about our city coffers running out of money because this thing is happening with no real eye toward the actual accounting um, and whether that will result in people having this heightened perception that immigrants actually can't stand on their own two feet and that actually they are just really um, being paid for by taxpayers who aren't really consenting to it. To me, that's kind of the worst possible political situation. And what I would rather do is convince people that and be very realistic that they're will probably be temporary bad adjustments and bad effects that result from a massive influx, especially of lower skilled, poor migrants. I'm still, I think, comfortable with those trade-offs. There could also be public safety trade-offs that come there. Again, I think we should enforce the existing laws we have on the books. Um, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the fact that disruption and chaos to some degree will probably result from letting a lot of migrants in. And I think that Advocates for increased immigration ought to own some of those trade-offs to a greater degree than they currently do. Zach, how do you look at it? Well, I think that the questioner has a, an assumption or assertion in there that we're, it's like, w I was for immigration, but now we're kind of all full up. And yeah, I, I just think the, that. the perception that the reason people have that perception is because of this growth of the state and the way that certain social services uh, seem to be stressed by an influx of immigrants and also just by and the they kind are of by them. Like it's not a perception yeah. that they are like New York is literally like running out of shelters to house people. Correct. And the, this, these are all the results of policy choices stacked on top of each other. And it's not just about how many immigrants are we letting in or not letting in. It's about what is the method that we are using to 
let people in? What is the the path that is being laid out? And there's it's created in my mind a giant um, sort of gray market in immigration where people are like kind of allowed to stay here, but they're they're not really certain about how about what the the rules are and. That's what I was looking for some clarification on in this debate was like, what what do libertarians really want? Um, like what what is the what what are the foundations of the libertarian argument for immigration and how how are we falling short uh, of of creating a system that is maximizing liberty for both for the people who are here and the people who want to come here. Cause it's, it's clearly the status quo is, is not doing that whichever side of the immigration question you're on. And so, I think, yeah, I think also we would be remiss. I totally agree with all of that. And I think we look at this issue quite similarly. I think we would also be remiss to fail to bring up the federal government sluggishness on, you know, when it comes to work authorization, we're creating this situation for whatever reason, which I think n neither side, you know, left nor right nor libertarians is particularly thrilled with, which is, hey, migrants come here, but in a particularly convoluted way where you're not totally sure what the rules are. And, oh, yeah, you need authorization in order to work. But we're really actually not going to give that to you for an incredibly long time if we even give it to you at all. And in the meantime, basically be a leech on the welfare state. And it's kind of like, well, wait a second. I don't think people who lean to the right want this. I don't think people who lean to the left really want this. I think they also do believe in a sense of like, you know, becoming integrated in your community and actually building a real life, a permanent life is important. I don't think the immigrants particularly want this. There's a sense of like uselessness that sets in that's very undignified when it's like you're literally you came to this country to build a better life for yourself and your family, a safer life, a more productive life, a life where you can actually squirrel away some money in hopes of providing a better future for your family. And yet now the government is telling you that you have to be a welfare recipient and you can't really work. I, I don't yeah. think that this is a situation that anybody's happy about. Yeah, it's perverse and it creates this sort of resentment. We've seen this in Europe, which has even more generous welfare state than us in a lot of regards. And there's been a sort of right wing backlash to immigration, I think, in large part. We talked with Johan Norberg a little bit about this because people because the natives feel so entitled to this increasingly generous welfare state the there's you can almost like track the relationship um and then there's also the question of if if the population feels like things are out of control or chaotic they also regardless of what the actual immigration numbers are it's just the chaos that is bothering them we saw that in the wake of Brexit. Once Brexit passed, and then um, the the immigration numbers actually didn't go down, but immigration suddenly became a less salient issue because the people felt like, well, we have a little bit more say over things, um, even though it didn't, you know, even though they're still letting a lot of immigrants in. So, the th those are the questions that um, I'm interested in getting to from a libertarian perspective. Is like, how do we create a sense of you know, uh, order and uh, address the legitimate security concerns at the border while also contending, while also just re um, embracing peaceful, hardworking people and giving them a way to get here uh, w without creating all these perverse incentives. So. Thank you for the question. I'm glad you enjoyed the debate. Uh, we are hoping to host many more debates, both kind of inter-libertarian debates and outside of libertarian sphere. I think that this is a great format for that. So we're pivoting uh, to cage matches and like, <laughs> um, you know, naked wrestling from now on. So our guests will have to come prepared for that, but it'll That's be more right. fun for the viewers. If you've got, a, if anyone else uh, has got questions or comments for us, feel free to hit us up at just asking questions at reason.com and we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.